Well, we're going to get started here. Um, welcome, everyone, um, and uh, welcome to Jim. Um, <clears throat> today, we're going to talk about uh, the newest tax legislation, which the, the president just signed a couple days ago. So a um, couple housekeeping items, and we'll jump right into it here. So um, submit questions in the chat. I think everybody should see the chat box. And uh, um, we will launch some poll questions for those of you who uh, need CPE. You'll need to answer those poll questions. Um, the presentation slides can be downloaded from the handout section of the webinar control panel. And uh, uh, we will, of course, record as we always do the webinar, and, and uh, we can send it out for on demand access later. So, and then finally, at the conclusion of the webinar, as we mentioned, a short survey will launch and again need to be completed for cpe credit so the certificates for for those of you who need them uh usually come out about two to three weeks after the uh the session so with that i'm going to try to jump right into this here and uh today we have uh our very own jim brandenburg from our milwaukee office and myself uh, i'm in the indianapolis office so um, a little disclaimer here, we won't uh, go through that, but we'll, uh, Jim, we're going to jump right into it. And Good morning and, and welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all for joining us here today. What we'll be looking at, again, is this uh, uh, Build Back Better or the uh, Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 that was, again, as Tom mentioned, just signed into law this uh, this week. Um, that will spend the, the uh, the majority or the bulk of our time will be going through that. We'll also talk on this CHIPS competitive bill that went through uh, this summer here, uh, one that's in the process, the Secure 2.0 Retirement Bill. And then actually a couple items that um, were from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed uh, several years ago that actually have an impact uh, this year and, and next year. So we'll talk on that briefly at the end. So uh, first thing we're going to go to is this um, Build Back Better Act or the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 again, that was signed into law. Um, and this is a, um, again, was a, uh, just a recap of this. We're gonna go through just a little bit recap, just kind of refresh and memory with this. This actually um, started about a year ago, you know, was that the, uh, uh, they were rolling it out uh, last August at this time. And then in September, it started out, but it, it operated in what they call these reconciliation rules, special set of rules in Congress uh, so it just needed a simple majority in the House and the Senate to pass this legislation. And again, uh, there's narrow margins that the uh, Democrat leadership had in the House and in the Senate, they had really no margin. There was a 50-50 split. So any any votes on this, uh, the vice president would um, cast a tie-breaking vote as it turned out uh, that was needed later on. Um, Normally in the Senate, there's a 60 vote margin, so it makes it very difficult to pass bills. But again, when they do the reconciliation, certain things to follow, uh, they can have a 50 vote margin. There were two Democratic senators, and we'll bring it up uh, later on, Senator Manchin from West Virginia and Sinema from Arizona. They were outspoken on some of the provisions in this Build Back Better and led to some changes, not only last fall when it first started, but uh, in this summer as it moved along. Okay, the, uh, the first thing again is it started uh, when it was really officially rolled out, it was last September with it. And again, just to refresh your memory, we'll bring this up a little bit later on. The initial version had some higher taxes for individuals, for corporations, uh, capital gains and dividends, we're gonna get taxed as ordinary income. There's gonna be no step up in basis in the states, uh, a number of other increases. So it was uh, a sig significant uh, tax uh, changes, tax hikes that were involved in that initial version. They rewrote that in October. And again, part of the reason they rewrote it in October was in the House, they were looking ahead and they weren't getting the support uh, from uh, especially Senator Sinema with it. So they tried to change it, rewrote it, took out a number of the tax hikes that were in there. Uh, the initial bill started out at three and a half trillion dollars uh, with many of these tax hikes. It was trimmed back to around two trillion dollars as it moved uh, as it moved forward. Uh, then finally, uh, the House passed this uh, in mid to November last year. Um, and again, it was a party line vote with it. It moved in to the Senate then in, in uh, late November. They thought the Senate might be able to get it done before the end of the year. They thought they might make some changes with it, but they were going to go ahead with it. 
Um, but then just before the end of the year, before Christmas, uh, you know, the, the legislation stalled. Senator Manchin said he would not support the BBB. He thought it was too large. And that just surprised many. And it really put the brakes on the bill. And the year ended. And negotiations uh, continued with it, but it was kind of on the back burner, really the first half of 2022. And no agreement was reached between uh, Senator Manchin and Senate Majority Leader Schumer. Then it was uh, interesting uh, with the inflation is, as everybody knows this year has really picked up. Um, and when the uh, July inflation figures came out, Manchin announced that due to the higher inflation, he would not support any energy plan or any income taxes in this Build Back Better. He, uh, he thought those it was too high, but it was just not the time to do that. Um, but even though he announced that, he said he would still talk about it. So for the next two weeks, he met secretly with Schumer to actually work out a, a deal. At the same time, there was a separate bill, this CHIPS bill that uh, Tom will talk about later, which was a sort of a competitive bill for semiconductors. Um, it was thought that that wasn't going to have uh, uh, you know, any impact, so that the uh, that was moving along at the same time, and um, that was not done under reconciliation. That was a normal vote that actually had some bipartisan support. So what happened on uh, July 27th? Again, this was just what about three weeks ago. On the morning of the 27th, the Senate voted for final approval of this CHIPS legislation. Again, many Republicans helped uh, support that bill. It was some bipartisan work with it. It got that bill to move forward. But the Republicans had some leverage. Once they voted for that CHIPS bill, they lost any leverage against the BBB with it. Then the shocker, late, uh, I recall this, uh, it was on the 27th, late in the afternoon that uh, Manchin and Schumer announced a deal that they had agreed on a Build Back Better. It was a $700 billion package that included both new taxes and an energy plan. And they renamed it uh, and said the Build Back Better was the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. So less than two weeks after, uh, Manchin said he wasn't going to move ahead with the bill because inflation was uh, too high with it. He had worked the deal with uh, Schumer to uh, come ahead with this, this bill that we have now. Oh, hold on a second, Jim. Like I'm a little, yeah, I'm having a little tech. There we go. Okay, no worries. Okay. Um, so let's look at this recap of what's in this uh, inflation reduction one. Again, uh, the revenue raise is going to be over $700 billion. A um, couple items, we're going to talk about each of these a little bit. This uh, corporate minimum tax, a 15% corporate minimum tax, is probably one of the larger revenue raisers in there. Um, IRS enforcement uh, is in there for 120. We'll talk about the, that. An excise tax on stock buybacks was added late, not the carried interest provision that was initially proposed with the mansion. Uh, a deduction for large losses under 461, that was an extension that was included in the bill. There was some prescription drug pricing reforms for Medicare that uh, Manchin had wanted that was put in the bill. Um, and then um, there was an extension of the ACA subsidy for, uh, for insurance premiums that will take uh, three years. We'll talk on that. And then some of the major changes were, uh, this was a lot of energy provisions that were included in it, energy incentives. And um, Tom will discuss that again. That was over $300 billion of some energy credits and incentives were part of this bill as well. <clears throat> so once it was introduced, um, again, Senator Sinema didn't even know that these discussions were being held with Manchin and Schumer with it. Uh, so I wasn't sure if she was gonna support the bill or not. Again, she'd had a big influence uh, on the bill uh, last year, it actually got the corporate rates down and the individual rates from being increased. Um, and finally, she announced uh, on August 4th that she would agree to the bill, but the carried, there was a provision that would get away with the carried interest to treat those as ordinary income. Uh, she didn't, uh, she objected to that position. She would vote against the bill if that was left in. So they needed to take that out and they put in this excise tax on stock buybacks and its place was added to it. Then this bird bath again is sort of a Senate, the part of this uh, reconciliation I mentioned earlier, the Senate parliamentarian goes through, reviews the whole bill, and if things are budget related, get taken out. So there were some changes, but nothing too significant were, were taken out in this bird bath. Then the vote is a very tedious process. It started on August the 6th, you know, just a week and a half ago here. And then they have this voter rammer where they can put all these different amendments with it. 
Um, a couple were uh, amendments were adopted. We'll talk on that as to what some of those did. Um, and then the final passage, uh, again, it was this 50-50 tie with the Vice President uh, uh, Harris Cassidy, the tie-breaking vote. And again, that was on um, uh, August 7th, the past. The House then uh, voted uh, last Friday with it. Again, there was no, there was some discussion that the House may want to try to get uh, some state and local tax assault cap into that bill, but they uh, did not. They just, uh, again, they passed the same bill that the Senate did as required. Um, and then the, <clears throat> with the bill being passed, it was sent to the president who signed it this week, I believe on Tuesday. So it is now part of um, part of the tax law that's been adopted here. So quite a change in uh, less than a month. Uh, this bill didn't look like it was gonna be uh, uh, adopted at all. It had been sort of in the back burner and it moved uh, quickly uh, once uh, Manchin and Schumer announced that deal. So here's some of the items again that we've mentioned before, I'm just gonna talk about again, this corporate minimum tax, the excise tax on stock buybacks, this extension of the large loss, IRS enforcement, which has gotten a lot of discussion lately. And then uh, actually the time's gonna cover the energy provisions uh, with it. Uh, next, let's go to the corporate minimum tax. Uh, 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 Jim, what is this uh, uh, bring back burp um, that you've got here in the, uh... This is uh, interesting uh, language. I didn't notice this. Yeah, well, that's a good question, Tom. Um, and for some of the folks uh, on the audience here may uh, recall this, this actually is a uh, provision. You know, some of these, you know, if you're uh, seasoned, if you will, uh, with some of the tax, you know, some of these things go around uh, and, and, you know, come back uh, years later. There was actually an adjustment like this for a corporate minimum tax back in the late 80s, the, the tax, uh, Act of 1986 brought this, uh, this what they call a burp adjustment, which was book untaxed reported profits, or it was this book income adjustment. So it was actually an adjustment. Uh, companies had to pay a um, minimum tax if their you know book income was much higher than their taxable income. They did have that. It applied a, a corporate minimum tax. It was actually in place for three years, and then it transitioned over to a, a, a separate one, which was the ACE adjustment. So they got rid of the book impact with it. So it was in place for three years. And again, it was really all corporations really needed to go through that. Um, this corporate minimum tax now that we have, however, is, is different than that, uh, that uh, burp adjustment, but it's somewhat the same concept that if a company has too much in reported income compared to its taxable income, it's gonna pay uh, you know, a little bit more tax in this minimum tax. Um, the reason it doesn't won't apply as much is that it's got a pretty high threshold. The company needs to have over a billion dollars in book profits under this, what they call uh, adjusted financial statement income, it's AFSI, uh, it needs to be part of it. So it's gonna be larger companies, probably mostly publicly traded, they're gonna be uh, subject to this. Um, a couple notes with it, there were a couple late changes, again, as they were trying to push this bill through the Senate. Uh, one was some depreciation changes, uh, you know, depreciation again, um, one of the areas or industries that this that this new corporate minimum tax was going to was going to hit was manufacturers. So they took this depreciation adjustment uh, out of the uh, the bill here, which again may um, uh, help some of the manufacturers or large manufacturers that would be subject to this. And then they also removed a, an aggregation provision that the way this billion dollars would be uh, determined is if you look at some related companies, related parties could be aggregated together to get toward that billion dollars, they might also be subject to it. So they took that uh, part of that aggregation provision out. I guess there's still some that's left in there, but they took that out. And again, that was designed primarily at the request of uh, Senator Cinema because it might affect the private equity firm. So uh, at least their change was to remove that. Uh, in its place, we'll talk about what they put in by taking out that um, aggregation provision for this uh, corporate minimum tax. Uh, again, it's a billion dollar average over the prior three years that you fall within this. One thing to know too, is if you're a, a US company that has a foreign uh, ownership and that foreign group has over a billion dollars of revenue, if the US company has over a hundred million dollars of profit, uh, they could also be subject to it. So something to be aware of. This first starts in 2023, so something to be aware of. Again, there might be some planning that you could do in 2022 that might then potentially um, 
not have uh, this tax apply when it first starts in 2023, but something to be aware of. Uh, one thing to note, it doesn't apply to uh, an S corporation. So anybody that's a pass through again would not have this uh, this new corporate minimum tax applying to them. Next one is a uh, you know one thing that the members of Congress don't like apparently is stock buybacks or redemptions. Uh, another term of that. Again, this uh, would start again also in 2023. So you may see some stock buybacks accelerated into 2022. It's a 1% excise tax on stock buybacks. Again, it does apply to publicly traded companies with it. Um, again, based on the value of the stocks that are acquired with it. Um, you know, one thing just to, to be aware of again, starting next year. There's a couple exclusions um, on the next slide here. Um, one thing is just to, to note as far as a couple exclusions from this stock buyback. Um, as part of a reorganization with it, or if some of the uh, <clears throat> the stock buyback goes an employee pension plan or an ESOP, you don't have it. Uh, you get up to a million dollars that you could do in a year. If it's less than a million, you don't have this. Uh, if you're a securities dealer, again, you're going to be buying and selling a lot of those stocks, so it doesn't apply to them. If it's treated as a dividend, so if this if instead of a redemption is treated as a dividend, it doesn't apply. And certain repurchases by um, uh, RICs or REITs, which are specialized companies. Again, certain items that don't apply. Again, uh, larger publicly traded companies are one thing that they're going to have to watch starting next year. Next one, as I mentioned before, when they made that change in the corporate minimum tax to take out the impact for uh, aggregated businesses, one of the uh, changes they put in is there's a, this came out of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act a couple of years ago, is a um, Limitation on large losses under Section 461, um, and uh, there's a $250,000 limit on losses you can take. It's $500,000 for a married uh, filing jointly. Those amounts are indexed for inflation, so it's 500 or 250 indexed for inflation. Those amounts go up. Um, last year, you may recall, the American Rescue Plan extended that through 2026. This bill would uh, extend it. Um, for two more years through 2028. So that was the late change. Again, this is um, expected to raise um, about $55 billion. So it was a sizable uh, impact, again, uh, on, on individuals you know, that generate these losses being able to take that. And then one last item here, again, doesn't relate to the large loss, but I just put it on this slide just to be aware, because again, it does apply to uh, uh, some startup type businesses. There is a, um, Research credit that actually been around uh, several years again for smaller companies um, under $5 million that have only been around a few years. If they generate a research credit, they're not paying any tax, maybe in a startup phase, uh, that that research credit can offset some of their payroll taxes. What this uh, this new bill did was to increase that from $250,000 to $500,000. So that's an annual credit that they can get uh, that the higher threshold of 500 starts in uh, 2023. But again, That'd be a smaller startup that uh, is there that can use that. It can offset uh, some of their payroll tax, which could include Social Security as well as Medicare, I think was one of the changes that was added to it. Once they exceed those uh, payroll taxes, that amount carries forward for them. Yeah, Jim, that's um, the employer portion of the the Social Security tax and medic and now expanded to Medicare tax. Uh, Correct. Being offset. Correct. So that. The credit does carry forward on the payroll tax uh, side, so an annual, and like you said, um, business less than five years in existence and, and under five million, I think, in gross receipts. Right. Okay, and then the last item that's got a lot of attention here is, uh, you know, going back to when they first introduced this Build Back Better was um, they wanted to have some additional IRS enforcement, um, and uh, so they're we're indicating $80 billion was going to be used for that. A significant amounts uh, that they're looking to hire new uh, IRS agents or employees, possibly eighty dollars to $90,000 is the, uh, the amount that has been thrown out there as far as uh, what that would entail. Not a lot of details with it. Um, you know, one thing that the, initially they said that they were going to be examining every taxpayer's bank statements. Uh, apparently that's not of the program. That was initially part of this, but um, Here's what the, at least the breakdown is of this $80 billion that the IRS is going to get. 
$4 billion for taxpayer service. So when you call the IRS that uh, they're gonna try to improve, but uh, you know, getting access to uh, some customer service for it. $45 billion for in enhanced enforcement. Again, not just audits, other um, investigation, other activities that the IRS is gonna look at uh, that they're gonna spend again, more than half of that uh, 80 billion. 25 for other operation support that the IRS needs uh, uh, that they've requested. And then about $6 billion for new technology and modernization uh, with their computers and other systems to try to enhance that. So a number of things that the IRS had been seeking and that to try to make them not only be uh, more operational, but uh, you know, go out and target the more individuals uh, for and businesses for audits. And then the next thing with it, one thing that the, the administration and Congress have said is that the, the, the intent is not to go out and audit individuals making, um, you know, less than $400,000 a year. So that was mentioned as far as in this legislation that that would be the uh, threshold, but there's no guarantees or assurances of that. So this is going to have a wide ranging impact for a number of years on both individuals as well as uh, businesses. Um, you know, again, it's their initiative with it. Uh, even some of the initial reports by the Joint Committee uh, Taxation in Congress said that it will have a wide application to affect taxpayers in all brackets with it. And it's difficult to, um, you know, when you think about it, if, if the IRS is going to audit the uh, partnership or an S corporation and they make the adjustment, well, you may have some of the partners or shareholders, some that may be making more than 400000 some that may be making less. Well, if you're adjusting that partnership, you can't make the adjustment for some of the partners, but not others. Again, it's gonna apply across the board. So if they do audit uh, some of these small businesses that are passed through, they're gonna make those adjustments for all the owners of it. And some of those maybe end up being uh, less than $400,000. So the other thing the IRS is facing now is you know, just over the last couple of years and with COVID, uh, some staffing shortages the IRS has. And um, you know, even with these new provisions, the IRS was looking at Upwards, I've seen of 40 to 50 percent of their personnel, you know, retiring over the next, uh, you know, five to 10 years. So they're not only facing, you know, transition within their existing workforce um, and some of the attrition that they're having, let alone trying to, you know, add uh, 80 to 90 thousand new agents. So there's going to be some challenges with them as they try to implement this. Uh, even before this came along, they were going to have some difficulty. I think this is just going to, um, while they're having more funding with it, they're still going to have some. Um, some challenges implementing that over the next few years. But again, you will see some enhanced uh, audit activity definitely uh, in the coming years. All right, Jim, I think we're up to our first polling question here. So you wanna read that to the audience? Okay. Our first polling question is, do you believe the increased IRS enforcement activities will impact those with an income of less than $400,000 per year? Yes or no? We'll kind of get yeah. the yeah, interested to see what, here. Uh, yeah, what uh, what everybody's uh, consensus is. This is a true poll. This is a political poll. Maybe we can get this on uh, on the major yeah. networks. So yeah, and we don't have a uh, you know other or a uh, don't yeah. know just yes yeah. or no. Yeah, we're gonna force people into making a decision here. So all right, give you a couple more seconds, and uh, we'll look at the results. Okay, uh, looks like a 80-20 split here. 80% said yes, 20% said no. Um, so, yeah, the uh, um, yeah. So most folks believe that that that, that will be um, affect uh, affect those under 400,000. You know, right. and 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 uh, the Treasury Secretary came out and and sort of uh, said that uh, the 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 audit rate won't increase for those under 400,000, but if they hire more resources, um, and I think they were using historical uh, rates, so right. uh, historic, historically they've audited more returns. So I think they're trying to go back to those historical rates. So, right. uh, so well, I think you will see some more activity across the board probably. Right. So uh, I want to cover uh, a lot of the energy provisions in the uh, the bill here uh, next. And um, what I will say is there's um, several um, there's several uh, opportunities for businesses, for homeowners, and not just tax credit opportunities, but I think you can, if you read into some of these, I think 
uh, our uh, some of our contractor clients and so forth may uh, see some uh, there's some there's some federal dollars that are going to flow into these uh, uh, you know reducing carbon footprint and so forth. So um, so Section 48 energy credit uh, extended uh, the time uh, for the credit as well as expanded that credit. So um, you know base credit before this act um, was 30 percent. Base credit going forward is actually 6%, but can be increased. Um, and you're, we're going to see a theme here. So uh, bear with me of um, uh, some of these credits and how they can be increased. So if it's a small project with maximum output of less than one megawatt. Um, so for smaller projects, uh, you know, the credit can be increased and basically up to 30% again. Uh, compliance with prevailing wage and apprenticeship program requirements. Um, including five years after the assets placed in service. So the servicing uh, of that asset, uh, the, those, uh, those wages have to comply with prevailing wage and apprenticeship program requirements. Don't have those requirements today, and I, I expect they're, they're in draft form already. But basically, um, you know, you're going to see this requirement in several provisions of these, uh, the, the new, some of the new credits. So. Construction, if construction begins less than 60 days after IRS guidance on prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. Uh, so um, the, the last provision is this is effective. This is effective as of the date the president signed um, the bill. So uh, once those guidelines come out, you have 60 days to start the project. Otherwise, uh, for, your, uh, for you to get an enhanced credit, um, on that uh, facility, um, you're going to have to uh, meet the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. So um, energy credit is for new or reconstructed type one and two solar, geothermal, qualified fuel cell and micro turbine uh, cogeneration, as well as groundwater heating and cooling and waste energy. So those types of um, energy efficient uh, or energy saving type facilities. Um, Extension is that uh, the, the construction start deadline um, now it, it was uh, 1125 or before, now it's up to uh, 2034, prior to 2034. Um, for uh, I'm sorry, it's it's just for the groundwater and heating, heating and cooling property, it's 34. So uh, for everything else, it's 1125. So the, the start of construction has to occur before that date for most of these other types of energy efficient facilities. And so the expansion is, um, again, you'll see a theme here, battery um, storage, energy storage is now qualifying project, biogas and microgrid controllers. So um, they've really expanded the definition of what qualifies um, for this credit. Okay. Um, so um, there's also some other enhancements. Again, this is a theme in some of these credits. Uh, domestic content requirements. Um, you can increase it to uh, the credit 10% um, as long as that project meets the prevailing wage and apprenticeship uh, requirements. If it doesn't, the, the the sort of bonus credit is only 2%. So that five times, um, you know, calculation comes in here too. Uh, brownfield sites, environmental justice facilities, as well as low-income residential projects. There, there's also some increases to the credit. So uh, it's very confusing. Uh, I read this bullet uh, again uh, this morning and uh, realized that maybe this was confusing. So when is this uh, effective? Well, it's effective now, uh, with, but certain of these new rules are effective at the end of this year, right? So one, one of 23, and you can see what those are. So the expansion of qualified property and the credit for domestic content, um, and some of these other uh, expanded uh, definitions, they're effective next year. But the, the wage, uh, you know, prevailing wage requirements are really effective immediately, um, except I think you have that 60 day window after the rules come out. So if the rules come mm -hmm. out uh, at, the, at the beginning of September, you have uh, probably 60 days to start that project. Otherwise, you're going to have to comply with those prevailing wage requirements in order to get the uh, the enhanced credit. So um, so that's section 48. Section 45 deals with the sequestration of, of uh, carbon dioxide. Um, and 
Credit was $20 per metric ton um, for assets placed in service prior to 2918 under, under prior law. And then there was a formula applied for uh, assets placed in service after that date. Um, and then if you, so if this was for uh, capture of, of, the, of carbon dioxide and disposal in secure geological storage. So if you don't know what that is, they store it underground, right? They, they, they pump the carbon dioxide underground and uh, in a secure geological storage facility. So, um, and then if it's captured and used as a tertiary injectant, which is a really fun word to say, tertiary injectant, um, the credit's a little lower because obviously you're not storing that. So um, what they did is they lowered the minimum capture requirements quite a bit um, so that more uh, facilities were uh, were eligible. And then they changed the you know per metric ton uh, numbers, right? So you can see them all right there. Um, and, and again, you can see if they store it securely, um, you know, $17 a ton. Uh, if, if it's used as a tertiary injectant, it's a little less, right? So, um, so the amount of credit is increased five times for any equipment or facilities that satisfy the, wait for it, prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirement, right? So you can see this theme coming over and over. So the minimum capture standards, which are lower, right? Which are lower are effective immediately, right? They're effective as of the day the present sign. So, so I think it gives the opportunity for, for carbon uh, oxide, you know, facilities that, that didn't have those higher, couldn't hit those higher standards that are in service right now, gives them an opportunity to get that credit, okay? Um, so, so, you know, those are all good. And I think there are, uh, some of our clients are looking at uh, some of these uh, energy credits as opportunities. Uh, I think there's more opportunity out there. Um, a couple of these uh, credits though, are gonna affect us as consumers. So uh, one of them is the, the non-business energy property credit, right? So your home uh, or uh, your vacation home now, as you're gonna see. Uh, qualify. So really enhanced credits here uh, under this uh, new bill, right? So remember under prior law, uh, there were lifetime limits, there was a 10% limit on uh, on the amount, you know, the, the purchase, uh, the value of the purchase. So um, under new law, and this is effective, uh, I believe effective at the, the beginning of next year. So we're still under, um, um, you know, the old rules until the end of the year. Um, so the greatly expanded energy efficient improvements um, placed in service before 1-1-2033 eligible for the new credit, okay? And the credit's limited to 30% of annual improvements um, um, installed. Roofs, um, roofs are out, so they're no longer considered uh, eligible for this credit. Um, does not have to be a principal residence anymore, okay? So if you have uh, you know, vacation home, uh, uh, you know, summer, summer cabin, or a couple of them, um, you can get the credit on those as well. No lifetime limitation, $1,200 limit per taxpayer per year, right? So think of this as, you know, slowly do some, some improvements uh, of, of energy efficiency type improvements. You do it over multiple years, you maximize your credit, right? Annual limits, $600 for windows annual limits, right? So windows, skylights, and other residential expenditures, and then exterior doors, there's an annual limit, okay? Heat pumps uh, really um, enhanced, and this is in addition to the $1,200 limit. So $2,000 limit for heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, biomass stoves, and boilers, okay? Also, um, you can get a credit of up to $150 for a home energy audit now. Um, there's a whole set of rules around, it's gotta be a certified home energy auditor and so forth. So uh, look for more information on that, right? Um, and then after 2024, um, there's more reporting, right? So it has to be the item that you put in service in your home has to be by a qualified manufacturer and has an ID number and we're gonna have to put those numbers on the return and there's probably gonna be some matching. So. So this is for properly placed in service after um, after the end of this year. So a lot of new credits out there, uh, enhanced credits. So I think uh, really uh, pay attention to those.
Um, I also wanted to mention, um, and, and I think this is really more where we maybe get into the business opportunity uh, for, for taxpayers that do not exceed 100% of area median income, right? So in Indianapolis, I looked this up, it's about $62,000 uh, for a household. There's rebates, right? And so um, those are going to be administered by the state's, um, you know, programs, right? Community action agencies uh, probably will 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 get uh, responsibility, and uh, they'll get some significant credits. Uh, I'm sorry, cr not credits. They'll get rebates, right? Installing heat pumps. So for for folks who are below that threshold, um, you know, th they will get some um, they will get some rebates um, to to put those in service in their home. So I won't go through all those, but I think this is probably a business opportunity for some because there's significant amount of uh, money allocated in the in the bill for this so um anyway so maximum rebate for homeowner is fourteen thousand dollars so the combination of those can't be more than that for a homeowner so um clean energy credit um used to the pre-ira we had what they called the reap credit um, and, and so the new law extends the credit for property installed before 2035, right? And it, and it expands it to, again, qualified battery storage technology is one of the things you'll see in several parts of this bill. Credit rates increased to 30% and then it kind of, it staggers down to, to 26 and 22 as years, as we go out further years. And um, um, this is effective for, for property placed in service um, after 21, except for the battery storage, which is, is the new technology, and that's after 2022. Um, 179D is something we see a lot in, in the commercial world. Um, so uh, if you uh, in, in put in place an energy efficient building, you can accelerate the deduction. This is not a credit. This is an accelerated deduction, okay? So the enhanced, so in the past, um, it was a dollar, basically a dollar eighty a square foot if you met certain ASHRAE standards for energy efficiency. Uh, it was up to a dollar eighty eight uh, inflation adjusted in 2022. Um, so the new law uh, reduces the standard, uh, the efficiency standard from, you know, a 50% savings energy savings down to 25. So it actually uh, lowers the standard. Uh, but it but it then implements a formula in, and puts a formula in place, so it's not as easy of a calculation as it was. Um, so the the applicable dollar value um, is going to be based on the percentage of total energy and power reduction. So it starts at 50%, and then it goes up two cents per percentage point, um, and uh, can't go over a dollar for for projects meeting the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements the adv right that is five times higher right so it starts at 250 and then you get 10 cents a square foot uh so for those projects you could get up to five dollars a square foot of uh accelerated deduction right so um, you know, five dollars a square foot is significantly higher than a dollar eighty-eight, um, but you have to meet those requirements. So, um, so again, really incentivizing commercial building owners to do that. Okay. Also, no partial deductions. So if you don't hit the twenty-five percent, you get it's a cliff, right? You get zero allocation of uh, the deduction to the design to so government buildings can, those deductions can get allocated to the to someone on the design team i think there's going to be more requirements around that to qualify to get that deduction so um and then also retrofit if you retrofit uh, a facility to be more energy efficient um you can also get some accelerated deduction there so effective after this year, right? Including retrofit property, okay? Um, so uh, 45L is a, a new home construction and it, it also can apply to multi-unit. Um, used to be a thousand to $2,000. Now it's up to 500 to $5,000, okay? Uh, if you look down at the second to last bullet point here, prevailing wage requirements, right, are going to apply and uh, for, for, for these homes to, to uh, comply, right? So you've got to meet these 
um, now Energy Star single family new homes or multifamily home uh, standards to get this. So it's really um, around the uh, you know HVAC system. I, I haven't read the rules yet. It could be expanded to other energy efficiency improvements, uh, but uh, it's a nice credit for a new home um, for the contractors that are building those. Clean vehicle credit, um, and uh, again, this is something that we have uh, seen in the past. It's changed quite a bit, 7,500 per vehicle. We had some limits on how many uh, credits, man manufacturers had these limits. Um, the new law changes the calculation, um, and it kind of splits it between the components and the critical minerals. And final assembly must be in North America. That is an immediately effective provision. Okay, so actually we have in our materials, which well, the IRS came out with something yesterday, which vehicles qualify for that final assembly, uh, which ones meet the standard. So um, must meet you know, battery standards um, and uh, battery components. Um, there's an increasing percentage until 2030 where it has to be 100% of the components are made in the US or, or mined. And um, you know, IRS will come out with more guidance on this. If it's a foreign entity of concern where you get some of your raw materials, you may not, the, the vehicle may not qualify for the credit. So here's kind of, a, this is a big deal, right? Um, dollar limits. Uh, Rivian, which is manufactured in, in Bloomington Normal, um, you, you know, vans and pickup trucks, they're more than $80,000, I believe. So um, so they may not qualify unless they get that, that uh, retail price down. And then all other vehicles, 55000 That's the dollar limit for those uh, vehicles to qualify. And uh, you've got limitations on the taxpayer. If you make more than 300000 modified AGI, you don't qualify. You don't qualify for that credit. So, um, so it's uh, you know I, I think we see a lot of our higher income taxpayer uh, clients buying those vehicles. So these limits will uh, will be significant. Okay. Um, so um, and then the credit um, they can there's a there's a transfer provision to the credit now too, right? So. Um, it, it's it's not considered you know the payment this credit isn't considered income to the purchaser and it's not deductible to the dealer um, you know the IRS is going to uh, make advance payments of credits to dealers so the buyer uh, if you exceed the limit the modified AGI limit you'll have to repay the credit on your income tax return now it applies for the year prior or the year of right this this whole transfer or uh, provision of the credit. Uh, I think you, you've got two years where you can look at the AGI, the modified AGI. So, um, so the, and, the, and again, the transfer rule only applies after 2023. So after next year, um, it, it, uh, it would apply. So, you know, you'll have a situation where the dealer will potentially give you cash back, apply the credit to the down payment. Um, the, all those things are probably in play after next year. It expires in 2032. Okay, so um, and then there's some transition rules for the rest of this year. Okay, previously owned clean vehicles, right? Uh, now uh, can uh, be eligible for a credit of four thousand dollars. Okay, uh, maximum sale price twenty five thousand for that used car must be more than two years old. Um, and you can't, uh, you know, you can't to, to meet the AGI limitations. You can't to have your kid buy it. Uh, so they're they're trying to uh, restrict uh, who the buyer can be. Um, and again, this is after 2023. So used vehicles um, now qualify uh, as long as they're more than two years old. So okay, commercial vehicles, new credit, right? New credit under this bill. Now commercial vehicles, uh, so your business buys a vehicle, it meets the criteria here. Um, it's either uh, a maximum credit of 7,500 for vehicles under 14,000 pounds, so trucks, vans, and then you know over the road trucks, right? Heavier vehicles up to $40,000 must be used on public roads. So it can't be off-road type vehicles, right? So, um, 
So, and then, uh, you know, have some other um, rules here on, on minimum battery capacity and so forth. So this applies next year, starting next year um, and before 2033. Um, what, what credits are transferable? And I won't go through all these, um, but uh, most of these credits are transferable. Okay, again, that, that's really after next year when the transfer provisions um, apply, right? Who, you know, so one thing to note here is actually tax exempt entities can, can get these credits as well and these income tax refunds. So, um, you know, make note of that, that uh, doesn't have to just be a commercial business, okay? Um, and then the, uh, um, you know, credits that uh, can be sold to other taxpayers, we've got a list of them here. And, uh, and um, um, those are, uh, I won't go through all those. So the last credit, uh, just touch on briefly is um, the uh, premium tax credit um, extended for another three years. So the schedule that was in place in, in, uh, in 2022 that was set to change is, uh, remains in place. This benefit, as Jim mentioned, estimated cost 64 billion um, and uh, limits um, you know, ACA marketplace cost a maximum of eight and a half percent of household income. So um, get another three years. The other thing is for those that are 400% or more of the federal poverty limit, they could still get some credit, whereas that was set to expire. So um, the employer limit for 2023 um, for the uh, for the um, for your health plan to qualify under ACA is still at nine is at 9.12. That changes every year. So um, anyway, so those those uh, provisions were extended as well. Okay, so a lot there on credits, um, but um, you know for for consumers, maybe for some businesses that are looking to uh, increase their energy efficiency. So I'll switch over to Jim here and he'll talk about the summary of uh, the um, act. Good, thank you, Tom. It's a lot of uh, helpful energy provisions, again, for individuals and businesses here. Just to recap here, um, just on this Build Back Better, which again, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, again, the same bill, it took about a year here. It's got a new name. It started out at over 3 trillion, ended up about 700 billion, so about 25% of the initial proposal had some significant across the board changes, tax hikes, that again, did not end up in the final bill with it. Uh, we got some major corporate taxes on stock buybacks and a corporate AMT and a number of these energy provisions, but for the most uh, folks have, it's just uh, <clears throat> the enhanced IRS enforcement that will impact them. This little chart on the next uh, slide here, uh, what offers this is, you know, kind of where some of these proposals that were out there with the ways and means, what actually passed in the house last fall, and they ended up in the final bill on the far right side. So you can see what ended up in that final bill is the corporate AMT and the stock buyback and this IRS enhanced enforcement, but everything else fell out with it. So that's, you might feel that, uh, you know, a sigh of relief that they didn't get some of those higher taxes imposed on you. However, uh, some of those could be brought back again, uh, you know, maybe, you know, next year or when Congress reconvenes, um, even the, uh, the chairman of the Ways and Means announced that uh, even though some of these didn't get in there, that he would look to bring those back uh, if they um, uh, have the opportunity to do that next year. So uh, again, you may have avoided it now, but uh, some of these may be brought back in the future. So keep that uh, on your radar screen. So um, let's move on here. Our next polling question here. Um, here it is, uh, as Tom talked about these credits, do you own or plan to own an electric vehicle for these new credits? Uh, the options are I own an electric vehicle. I do not own one but I'm considering buying one. I do not own an EV and have no current plans of buying one. So if you could offer your vote here and um, we'll, we'll keep the presentation going. Again, we appreciate uh, uh, you answering these questions here. And again, uh, as Tom noted in his discussion, there's a lot with these uh, new credits for electric vehicles, both for new and now with used. So something uh, to be aware of. Okay, let's okay. close that poll here. Uh, we've got 2% who own one. Um, I do not own um, one, but are considering it about uh, 20, almost 20%, and then 80% do not own one or have no plans to. So 
Okay, that's helpful. Uh, interesting yeah, insights here. So yeah, right. Interesting. So we'll okay. uh, I, we have we have one slide, Jim, on the uh, the chips bill. Um, we didn't cover. The, there were several credits that. Um, we were in the uh, I, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act bill. We didn't necessarily cover uh, one of the, uh, but there are some uh, uh, bill. There are some credits for advanced manufacturing. The the uh, the Chips Act, uh, the Chips Plus Act, I should say, um, you know, um, is a, a 25% credit for. And I'll just read this: a facility for which primary purpose is manufacturing semiconductors or, or semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Okay, so what it doesn't cover are all the components, right? So if you are a uh, let's call it a, if you're a manufacturer of components for the semiconductor industry, uh, you, there are some credits in the um, Inflation Reduction Act bill. We didn't necessarily cover all those, but but there's a lot of tax credits, a lot of um, grant dollars and so forth around the semiconductor industry. So, um, you know, um, look at that. Um, they're specific to those kinds of businesses. Okay. Um, cover a little bit. Uh, w w one thing we do expect um, going forward, Jim mentioned some of the uh, uh, provisions that uh, didn't make it into this final bill, but the Secure 2.0 is a retirement bill we've been following. We feel pretty strongly that um, there's bipartisan support for this. It did pass mm -hmm. the House. There are two versions of that bill. I think the Senate has some different provisions, but but similar um, language. And uh, we expect really, if we were predicting, Jim, I think we'd expect by year end um, right. that, that, that something would pass. Uh, they would get together on that because there's it really passed by a wide margin. In the Senate. So, what are some of the things in that? Or I'm sorry, in the House, the Senate is is considering it: expanded automatic enrollment uh, in retirement plans and uh, and uh, enhanced credits, 100% uh, credit from 50% prior um, of credits to uh, help offset some of the administrative costs for plans. Um, they're really trying to get more and more um, workers to uh, save for their own retirement. And, and I think this is all designed uh, to, uh, uh, because I think there's a big social security bill in the horizon over the next you know, three, three years or so. I think they're gonna have to address the social security funding issue. Um, a couple other things of note, uh, increase in age for required minimum distributions. Um, you'll see that. Um, it's a little bit uh, different in the Senate versus the House bill, so hard to say where that will end up, but, but certainly expect that to increase. And we've got, oh, geez, we got another polling question here. So Yeah, well, we've got to get our third one yeah, in here. Right. Uh, we're getting in the home stretch here, Tom. Our third polling question, again, back to the IRS funding that we talked about. With the increase in IRS funding and an expected increase in compliance activity, which area of tax compliant concerns you the most? Again, with the more audits, we have a personal or individual income tax, business income tax, or the employer retention credit, the ERC that, that we've covered on some of our other webinars uh, that people have taken advantage of uh, is on the uh, target perhaps is having some uh, review here this year and then going into the future. So uh, if you could just put your uh, uh, selection for one of these uh, uh, items here for this polling question. Okay, let's see the results with the personal income tax, a little more than half, uh, 54%, about a third with uh, business income tax, and then uh, a little more than 10%, uh, the employer retention credit. So interesting, uh, we'll see how this plays out as, again, this IRS enforcement uh, takes off here. Okay, thank you again for voting on that. Uh, our last thing is these aren't really tax changes that were part of this uh, you know, Inflation Reduction Act here but uh, really are some ones that actually took place back with the Tax Cut Jobs Act that passed in December of 2017. that actually first take effect here in 2022 or 2023. So I wanna make you aware of them. Again, Congress could change these, could extend these, but uh, they're out there. Um, first dealing with the interest expense deduction, there's some changes in how that calculation makes that's gonna make it more difficult to deduct your interest. The research expenditures uh, the companies have, uh, has some changes also here in 2022 and then starting next year the bonus depreciation of 100 percent that many are familiar with that starts in 2023 to get the scale back to 80 percent so companies looking to get some major equipment or machinery in 
you know, get that in before the end of the year, you get that still that 100%, whereas next year it drops down to 80%. Um, next slide here. Uh, and then again, not too far out again, we, we thought this would be a long ways out, but it's not that far out. In 2026, a number of the changes uh, that were made in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act revert back to 2017 levels. Corporate uh, tax rate, however, will not change, but the individual rates will change. Uh, the child credit, the AMT exemption, that salt cap at $10,000, the 20% qualified business income deduction, a lot of businesses, small businesses take, that gets eliminated. Some of these things are going to have to get extended, the estate tax exemption. So again, there's going to be uh, some major um, efforts that Congress to deal with these as we get close to 2026. The research expenses I mentioned, um, again, those have been fully deductible in the past, starting here in 2022. Uh, instead of deducting those, you have to amortize those over a five-year period, and you only get a half year in the year of, um, you know, when you have those expenses, you only get 10%. So a significant change on that here starting in, in 2022, again, unless Congress changes and defers the effective date of that. Um, next slide on, just a brief example, if a company has, uh, you know, a million dollars, those R&D expenses, uh, instead of being able to deduct that full million dollars, only gets to deduct a hundred thousand of that so that's a uh, nine hundred thousand dollars they'll spread over five years but uh, a significant uh, increase potentially in their income for this year next slide uh, tom with it uh, again so um you know we just talked on what may happen with it again there's some bipartisan sentiment to to uh delay that they had a couple options with the legislation this summer didn't do it uh something to keep our eye on with it but you know, you might want to plan to to adjust for that now if you're doing any estimates or review, and then if it does get extended later on, then you can adjust uh, back if you've overpaid something. So keep an eye on this research uh, expenditures. Again, this is the expense, not the credit. Um, and then the interest expense one, just to, one thing to note is uh, when you do this calculation, it's 30% of what they call your adjusted taxable income. Um, one of the things that you did is you added back your depreciation and amortization. That was a big adjustment, especially for some manufacturers had a lot of depreciation. That adjustment does not take place in 2022. So uh, if you've got a lot of depreciation, you're not going to add that back, which makes that, that threshold for deducting your interest higher. So you couple that with higher interest costs we have now, you're going to have a number of companies uh, that may not be able to deduct the full amount of their interest this year. So we're going to probably talk about that later this fall with one of our other sessions, but something to be uh, aware of with it. And there really hasn't been as much talk about changing or modifying this as uh, we have seen with the R&D expense that we just mentioned. So um, and there's an example that kind of goes through that, uh, you know, the uh, company with, again, has a lot of depreciation, amortization, does not get to add that back in its calculation and ends up uh, with not its interest being limited. So uh, we'll go through that uh, example. You can see on the next slide here, uh, again, uh, in the first case in 2021, was able to fully deduct all its interest of 600,000. In 2022, they have 900,000 of interest, only 300,000 is deducted, 600,000 is carried forward. So anyway, something to uh, to be aware of then, um, you know, as you move forward with it uh, here in, in 2022. Uh, this last one really won't, uh, you know, uh, cover much here. Um, you know, it's just one that uh, we saw this year. We thought we'd point out uh, a key with charitable contributions is getting the right documentation. In, in this case, you know, usually one of the language that you see with your documentation is, you know, that nothing was provided in return for that donation. Uh, in this case, they didn't have that language in that, even though they acknowledged, IRS acknowledged they'd received this property, they didn't get that. They lost a $460,000 deduction without that. The reason I bring this up is one, just to make sure that you know, if you're making your donations, you get the, the right language in those qualified acknowledgements. But this may be an area that, again, we've got 87,000 new IRS agents out there. They may be looking at this documentation. So uh, it's important to make sure that you uh, gather that. So um, with that, uh, again, we uh, wrap up here. We appreciate your patience here, Tom. If any closing uh, comments that you've got for everybody here for uh, housekeeping uh, items for them. Yeah, I just noticed, you know, some of the examples uh, seem to be weighted toward uh, maybe the uh, University of Wisconsin, so it's concerning, but we'll uh, we'll let that go and uh, go to our closing items here. But 
I know we do have a couple of questions. We will answer those. We want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, and, th and thanks, Jim, for, for all of that. Um, you know, uh, to your point, uh, IRS uh, enforcement is going to increase. So uh, some of these details, like the charitable example you gave, uh, are going to be more important as we see uh, more enforcement. So um, just a couple of housekeeping items here. We'll wrap up. Thank you all for joining today. As a reminder, um, you know, the survey will pop up after the webinar and we'll get answers to any questions. If you have any, I know we got a couple to answer after the, the seminar or webinar here. Um, and it is a recorded session. We mentioned that earlier, so uh, you can go back and listen to it later. Um, and uh, um, we do have all of our sessions that we've done in the past recorded um, in, in Sikich on Demand. You can go back to that hub and uh, find those. And so uh, with that, thank you, Jim, and thanks to uh, all you, of our marketing. Thank you, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks to all of our marketing team and I uh, want to wish you a uh, wonderful day and uh, and uh, let us know if you have any questions about the, uh, the, the information we provided today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.